Chef Mervold, welcome to the show. Well, thank you. Glad to be here. I owe you a huge debt of gratitude <clears throat> because during the pandemic, it was almost impossible to buy dumbbells anywhere in the world. And you put out a cookbook about a decade ago. <laughs> it weighed about 50 pounds. Oh, there you go. Or less. And, uh, you know, that's what saved this fine physique was that uh, I was able to <laughs> use your, uh, um, you got a new cookbook out that I'm super excited to chat about today. I've only gotten to see the digital version, but it is equally as uh, robust. Modernist Pizza coming out in October, yeah. um, a three volume. And I wanted to start with the inspiration of the first one uh, almost a decade ago now was sort of a category creator really, but tell us the inspiration. What was the, uh, what's the reception been over the last decade for that book? Well, you know, if you want to learn about cooking, whether it's classic French cooking or Italian or Chinese or almost anything you want, there's some big book you can buy or a whole collection of books. Um, and I thought this, had to be true for modern cooking techniques. That's techniques that chefs have developed in say the last 10 or 20 years. And I tell you, if I had found that book on the market before I wrote mine, I wouldn't have written it. Uh, but there was no such book. Uh, people covered, the, the set of cookbooks that were out there covered a lot of classical or older techniques. They uh, they covered the French Nouvelle Cuisine Revolution, which was in the 1970s. They covered some of what happened in uh, California cuisine and sort of new American cuisine going into the 80s and uh, early part of the 90s. But there wasn't anything that was about really up-to-date, state-of-the-art cooking. Uh, so I thought, oh, well, maybe I should write the book myself. <laughs> and uh, it uh, took five years, but uh, I and a team of people accomplished it. Um, wound up being a lot bigger than we thought. It's a, a you know, 2,300 page book um, across uh, five volumes. Uh, but it, it, which is very unlike any other cookbook that is out there, uh, different price point, different weight, different everything. Uh, but it's gotten an incredible reception. Uh, so that book has uh, sold pretty well. We have a Modernist Cuisine at Home that was a uh, two volume uh, sort of simplified version of that. Then we came out with um, Modernist Bread, which is another big six volume book. And altogether we've sold about 300,000 of these things. So uh, it was really quite a successful uh, uh, venture and that that's only prompted me to do more <laughs> well the, the fun thing about the book is it's like equal parts history uh myth busting science um and i don't understand how anyone can publish a cookbook without pictures and i remember so i grew up in the southern family on my mom's side of cooking and it was very much like a, a feel you know you the taste as you go and we even still have some recipe cookbooks from my grandmother and it's almost impossible to follow because then it's like then add onions i'm like what does that even mean does that mean does that mean like a cup does that mean and um yeah but they were ama amazing cooks but they knew it by feel and i remember looking at their cookbooks and being so um not impressed because it's just words on a page with no pictures and one of the things you guys did was absolutely gorgeous photography um, on and on, which, you know, must have taken, uh, one of the reasons the book's not $10, by the way, listeners, um, <laughs> but uh, was the defining char characteristic of the book. What was some of the uh, reception of the recipes looking back over the last 10 years that were either surprised you or ones where people, uh, you know, gave some pushback on any uh, particularly memorable recipes from that book that really stand out? Well, you know, at the time the book was championing a bunch of ideas that were in, say, the, the most cutting edge um, uh, chefs. Uh, and some of that has been called molecular gastronomy. 
And some of it was fairly controversial at the time because there were people who sort of had an ideological problem with someone having a foam on a plate, for example, that wasn't whipped cream. Whipped cream they're cool with, you know, maybe a mousse that's whipped they're cool with, but oh my God, you whipped sweet potatoes? Yeah, it's really delicious. So why, well, I, I didn't understand why it should be, you know, something like uh, whipping, which we're totally used to for dessert with whipped creams and mousses and so forth. We're totally used to in our drinks with lattes and foaming. Well, why is a foam on a savory plate so damn weird? Well, <laughs> I don't know why, but it was. Um, and since uh, the book came out, uh, I should say another thing was about this book is it, prior to it, the way the only way to learn the set of techniques that were in that book would be to go and be an apprentice, or in French, that's called a stagiaire in a bunch of three-star restaurants all around the world. And so very few chefs had the ability to learn it. Um, and we tried to make our recipes, unlike your grandma's, we tried to make them very specific. So we would have weights of everything, including the weight of salt. Um, why? Well, I wanted people to be able to make it even if they'd never tasted it. Um, and that means you got to be a little bit pedantic about describing everything. But then that uh, it enables people to use these techniques regardless of where they grew up, regardless of what training they had. And as a result, um, I now, when I go to a restaurant, I see these techniques all over the place, even in restaurants that you might think would be quite traditional. Not necessarily. They're, they're willing to be open-minded about the technique. You know, sous vide was something that we uh, championed as a good technique and a very useful technique. And uh, now people are selling hundreds and thousands or millions of those sous vide units a year. And it's out there. I don't think there's a single professional chef who hasn't heard of it. Um, yeah, you know, that's funny because um, I'm very much an experimental chef about Half the things I try, and I try to learn by doing, half of them come out good. Uh, a quarter is like amazing, all time, best thing ever had. And a quarter is like totally inedible. Um, yeah. So I definitely adopted the, the sous vide technique from your book in the early days, the, um, the cooler sous vide, right? Yeah. Beer cooler one, the, or the sink. Then eventually bought whatever the box one that was like 500 bucks. And now, I know, like you mentioned, Innova, you can buy one for $100 or something yeah. now. And the reception used to be from friends and everyone. They say, oh, this seems so fancy. I say, it's the exact opposite of fancy. It's it's like kind of the idiot's guide to cooking the perfect temperature. And by the way, every restaurant has this. You just don't know it. Yeah. It's back in the back in the kitchen. Um, I'm, I want you to help me settle a debate. And this is a little bit of pressure because this is a marital debate. Uh -oh. my, wife, my wife and I um, were driving to an Angels baseball game this week. And uh, my son's in the back seat. He's four, and um, we're going to see Otani pitch. And uh, we were talking about cooking. I said I'm going to do a, a cooking podcast this week, and she's like, "Uh oh." And I said, "You know, um, I got a question for you." And uh, I said, "Why does bad food still exist?" And she's like, "What do you mean?" I said, "Well, you know, you go to plenty of restaurants or whatever, and you have a a terrible turkey sandwich or." Uh, you go get some awful version of universally seen as awful, not just like, hey, this is your taste, yeah. but this is just absolutely terrible. You can go two doors down to the turkey sandwich place that has the best turkey sandwich in LA. Why not just re go replicate that? And we got into a long debate. So I want to kick it to you and I'll tell you which side you fall on, mine or hers, <laughs> and, and who gets to win on this debate. But um, in a world of millions of recipes, of uh, knowledge compounding over time, learning from others' mistakes. Why, why, why is there a scenario where either from the owner's perspective or consumers, why does bad food still exist? Well, it's a really good question. Um, you, you know, the uh, one reason is of course that people choose where they eat based on a variety of factors, not just food quality. 
So convenience is super important. You know, if, if the place with the better sandwich has a line down the block, you might say, well, I'm really hungry. I'm going to the place I can go right into. Uh, there's the issue of cost. Um, you know, uh, one of the things I tell people is if you want to upgrade how you eat, you almost always have to pay more in either money or convenience or both. You know, convenience because the artisanal baker, you, know, you got to drive to that store. It's not right there in the supermarket. Um, and it's going to cost a little bit more. Now, is that worth it to you or not? Um, in general, when people are given a choice, the, they love that. So, uh, you know, when I grew up, chocolate was Hershey's. That was like it. And, uh, you know, candy bar was a coin. <laughs> I mean, which period of time it was a, you know, a dime or a yeah. you know, 25 cents or, or, or more. Um, well, chocolate's undergone a renaissance. So today in LA or in, uh, here in Seattle, you could probably buy 50 different chocolate bars. And some of them will be quite exotic, you know, Guatemala, and, um, you know, shade grown, certifiable, uh, organic. And you pay more for that chocolate bar. But there's people who love that. Coffee is the same way. Okay, coffee, when I was a kid, it was Folgers and Uban out of a can at the grocery store. Um, and coffee was like this cheap thing that cafes knew they had to serve. So it was a, it wasn't a destination thing. Well, now with both Starbucks and, uh, and then lots of independent, um, baristas out there, premium coffee is a thing. And there are people that are willing, not, not everyone's willing to search it out. I don't mean like a hundred percent of us want uh, Tanzania pea berry or, you know, Costa Rica Tarazu estate um, or care about the difference between a pour over and a latte and a, we may not all care about it, but enough of us care that we've been able to drink a lot better if you care about coffee. So, you know, I think this process of being able to find uh, things that uh, our high quality is something that has rippled through the food world. Um, and that's largely happened in my lifetime. Uh, not, not because I had anything to do with it, mm. but uh, you know, I was born in 1959, so the end of the 1950s. And the 1950s and well into the 60s after that, it was about abundance and price and convenience because most moms were working moms. They weren't just uh, preparing food at home. And that, you know, if you optimize for convenience and price above all else, you get some bad stuff. But it's convenient or it's cheap, right? That's, that's the trade-off. Um, now, that said, I, I can't tell you that this is why all of the bad places <laughs> exist because there are terrible restaurants all over the place. Um, now, some of them are just terribly inconsistent, meaning on a good night, it's spectacular, and on a bad night, it, 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 it isn't. And some are just low quality, but for some set of reasons that is, for example, uh, national brands of food, like uh, fast food chains, McDonald's or Pizza Hut or whatever, they bring a certainty. You know, you, it's super convenient and you know what it's going to be like. You, you don't have, if you're betting on the local burger place, it might be excellent or it might be garbage, but, you know, McDonald's or Burger King is going to be what they always are because they're, they're all about that consistency thing. And that's valuable to people. And if you sort of forget that that consistency thing is valuable, you look at the world in a way that it isn't. Um, the, the, our, our attraction to big national brands for things is because consistency uh, and, and what that brand means in that 
makes sense to us. Yeah, the um, a good example. So my single favorite recipe from your Modernist Cuisine book uh, was was the macaroni and cheese. Uh, is the macaroni and cheese you put in? I think it's sodium citrate, and it just has such a like cheesy, chewy macaroni and cheese. And I I think I made this for my mom, and she she's like, "Are you joking, Meb?" And I said, "What?" And she goes, "There was a moment in her childhood where." I spent, you know, a lovingly amount of time making homemade macaroni and cheese and brought it out to you. And uh, she's like, you refuse to eat it. And I said, you know, <laughs> why? And you said, what is this? What is this? This is a mac and cheese. And, uh, you know, and and because I was referring to craft mac and cheese, like that was mac right. and cheese. Like whatever this homemade craft artisanal mac and cheese is garbage. So, right, there's like a element of nostalgia, I think, too. Um, but the funny thing about the debate is I was sort of erring on the side as like a business owner, as a, as a, you know, um, someone who just thinks about this to where, you know, I said in this world of knowledge and, and automation, which kind of you almost touched on, uh, this shouldn't exist as much. And so here's the punchline. We go to the game and um, I would get some like beer and peanuts. And my son's like, Hey, my son and wife are like, I want pizza. So I go get some, and because of COVID, like half the restaurants are closed. So I come back with like $40 worth of one pizza and it's probably the worst pizza in the world. Well, here I am as a consumer after directly having this debate, yeah, um, consuming a bunch of terrible pizza. And I, I'm not going to call out the pizza name, uh, but it was, it was so bad. We ate it, of course, we ate it, it's pizza. So even bad pizza is okay. But uh, so she just kind of smiled at the irony. Uh, well, and, and I think we that's are. a great, the convenience is, is the issue right that's it, you're there at the game you're not going to comparison shop all across town you're only going to buy something there and you know crassly they don't have to be any better to sell a lot of pizzas yeah. and there's probably someone who prefers them yeah. you know, so yeah. it, with pizza in particular in our book when we would occasionally all right we traveled to 300 pizzerias around the world to try what the pizza was. And we get things where we might be critical of some pizza and someone who grew up on it says, oh, but I love this, I grew up on it. And eventually my answer became, well then keep growing up. <laughs> you, you know, the, the, if you give a kid a jalapeno pepper, or you give a, a, a kid tonic water, they're gonna think you poisoned them, <laughs> right? They, they don't like the super spicy stuff usually. They don't like the super bitter stuff like tonic water, but I promise you there will be a billion gin and tonics poured today somewhere on our planet. Mm. So as we go from being, adult, being kids with, with a very safe set of uh, food ideas, we eventually say, ah, I like the hot sauce, or I like gin, which has got this weird burning sensation and so forth. And I like tonic water. Be why? Well, in this combination, it makes, it makes sense to me, and it's actually thirst quenching and good and whatever. Um, the trouble is we do, we have very strong food memories. And those food memories of something that was, you know, in, in our childhood, uh, the nostalgia part can easily overwhelm the uh, the more critical part and, and say, you know, hey, this is the way I've always had it. This is the way I want it, um, as opposed to uh, something that was uh, actually tastes better. Yeah. I mean, in, so, in the case of that mac and cheese, the reason ours tastes better is really simple. Um, the sodium citrate that is added uh, helps the cheese emulsify and stay as a nice gooey sauce, not separate. In ordinary mac and cheese, you put a bunch of flour in to do that. And that flour, the starch coats your tongue and it dulls the taste and it makes, it doesn't taste as cheesy. So if you like the cheese part, it's way better. Um, now, if you love Kraft Mac and Cheese, 
I can't, I'm never going to tell you, oh, you shouldn't love crack craft mac and cheese. If, if that's what you're committed to love, that's great. But by the same token, uh, I don't feel constrained to go and say all mac and cheese has to be the way you remember as you grow up. Yeah. I can try to make the ultimate version. And some people will approach it from a culinary open mind and say, God damn, this is better. Yeah. And others will well, approach it from a closed mind, but for a very good reason, and say, oh, this is not the mac and cheese of my childhood that I, I dream of. For uh, Before we hop over to pizza, were there any um, recipes that truly stand out from like uh, consumers or chefs that read the book and were like, oh my God, your short rib or your whatever, this, this one recipe is just like knocked my socks off. There's a restaurant down the street that was like, a defining restaurant that opened in LA from a chef and he had this menu of you know great um offerings but the thing that they've become known for that was like an afterthought they made for uh the uh the employees when they did the dinner was baker bacon cheddar biscuits and he's like yeah. we never even intended to put that on the menu and that's what they're known for now um anything yeah. in the in the book oh, that really stood out sure the, i mean the, a lot of people love our mac and cheese uh there's a um caramelized carrot soup made in a pressure cooker that is a pretty unique mm. recipe. Um, there's, uh, it depends on who you are as to what thing resonates with you. With, with some people, it's the better version of mac and cheese. With, uh, with other chefs, it's something that's way more esoteric, but it's something that just particularly solves a problem they had in the kitchen or scratches an itch they have in terms of a kind of food they wanted to uh to eat yeah um well good let's hop over to pizza um i'm glad you didn't stop at shakey's uh which is where <laughs> it sounds like you grew up eating pizza which i don't think i've ever been to in la um but uh no, they're gone in la now um oh. shakey's as a chain still exists but mostly in asia huh. um but it was the first chain food of any kind we there was a franchised Jakey's franchise uh, pizza started in Sacramento in 1953, which was before McDonald's or fried chicken or any of the other um, sort of staples of American uh, fast food. So pizza is sort of having its at home renaissance, you know, over the past few years, more and more friends, uh, you know, are buying these outdoor ovens or working uh, you know, I've always been, I feel like a little reluctant to try pizza because it's a little more effort and involves the dough. Uh, you know, usually if you make your own dough, it's, it's a little more of an effort. Um, so walk us through sort of the book in general. I mean, my favorite part is you, you start out talking about cookbooks in Italy, you know, 1500 years ago. <laughs> and said, so, by the way, <laughs> Italian food wasn't Italian food. It looked more like, I think you said Thai or Thai food. food or something. Yeah. Uh, so give us a little uh, overview tour of uh, the new books. Yeah, well, we start off with history. Um, history is particularly problematic in pizza because individual pizzerias will often market themselves on this story about how they were the first one or they've had a recipe in their family for 300 years uh, because it's sort of an appeal to say, hey, the, I have a secret from the past. and that resonates with the food world, resonates surprisingly well, frankly, in the food world. Um, you know, if you went to the Ferrari dealership and they said, ah, we only use techniques from Italy from 500 years ago, you'd say, uh, I, I, I'm sorry, I wanted the fast sports car, the state of the art. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but for other Ital for Italian cooking, this idea of the past is important. So we've got a big topic on that. We have a bunch on science. Um, for example, uh, pizza ovens are generally very hot. And because they're hot, they do almost all of their cooking with light, which is to say radiant heat. So it's like a broiler. Um, the uh, most uh, professional pizza ovens have an open door. Well. If you cared about the temperature of the air, you'd never leave your door open. It turns out the reason to leave the door open is 
They don't give a damn about the air temperature. Uh, what they care about is the radiant heat that comes. And so we did a bunch of experiments to show that to people. Um, well, that's important because then uh, when you're manipulating a pizza, uh, you know, the very few pizza ovens, unfortunately, are very even. So if you put your pizza into the oven, whether it's a professional oven or an electric and a deck oven are different, but if you put it into a wood burning oven or a gas burning oven, it's not even, and you've got to use the, the peel, which is the big shovel-like thing that you use to move the pizza around. You've got to use that to turn the pizza, otherwise it'll burn on one side and be raw on the other. I like thinking of these things from a very first principles reason. So the edge of a pizza is usually puffy and it's taller than the dough in the center of the pizza. Why is that? And the usual answers people will give is they'll say, oh, well, because the, you leave the dough thicker at the edge. It turns out, no, that's not true. Then people say, oh, well, it's because of the weight of the stuff that you put in the middle. You, know, you put all this cheese and other stuff and that weighs it down. Turns out that's not it either. Um, it all comes down to the fact you put sauce on it and the sauce is wet. And the wet sauce in that hot oven is gonna evaporate like crazy, but the sauce can never get more than the boiling point of water. And so we did a bunch of experiments to prove that to people, which was interesting because we had lots of pizzolos, that's the Italian word for a pizza maker, um, who didn't believe a word of what we were saying. You know, we, we would cover the um, pizza with sand of the same weight as the sauce and the cheese, for example, and would just puff up and push the, sand, uh, the stuff aside. Um, then we talk a lot about different styles of pizza. So pizza is known uniformly around the world. Uh, almost every country on earth has pizza. Um, we actually checked and we, we called a bunch of um, uh, embassies and missions to the UN. I think we found there's three or four countries that don't seem to currently have a pizzeria, <laughs> but only three or four out of a, you know, 170 countries, something like that. And it was funny when we would contact their embassy and we'd say, hey, is there any pizza in your, in your, in your uh, country? And, uh, even on ones where we'd not been able to find a record of it, we almost always got them saying, oh yes, you go to this place. And mm -hmm. uh, they knew uh, uh, about it. Um, so anyway, we have to discuss how styles change. And mostly in pizza, what style is, is people would change the recipe. For example, you have a crust. Well, there are some pizzas that have insanely thin crusts. There's some that have insanely thick crusts. It's almost like bread, you know, it's two inches tall. And there's a whole pile in the middle. Well, then there's how much uh, toppings do you put on? Well, that also varies, right? There's people who have a thin crust, but put it in a deep dish and then they fill it up like a pie. That's a Chicago style pizza. Um, there's other pizzas that's almost like a cracker that had a little bit of seasoning or, or cheese put on the out on top of it. So we wanted to try to explain both how that occurred and what some of the differences are around the world. Um, uh, when we go into how to make pizzas and it fundamentally- and by, the, by the way, by yeah. the way, before we move, before we move on to that, um, I was familiar with most of these. I think most listeners would be familiar with, hey, we got thin crust, we got sort of the Chicago or maybe Detroit style. I had never heard of Brazilian pizza <laughs> as, a, as a main. Like you, I think there was maybe about six main kind of ballpark yeah. um, types of pizza you guys cover. And Brazil <laughs> was one of those. Can you, can you tell us listeners what well, that is? Okay, I so heard of it. the reason we have pizza in the United States is very simple. We got Italian immigrants in the United States. And that started around 1870 when Italy became a country. And there's lots of economic and political turmoil. Two million people left Naples and moved some other place. Well, a bunch of them, people from Naples moved to the US. 
but a bunch went to South America. And as a result, Brazil has had its own unique pizza culture from the 19th century onward. It's just as old as ours. Yet it's also developed in its own unique way. So it's kind of interesting to see how, you know, it's, it's one of these path not traveled things of in Sao Paulo, you know, which is a city of 10 million people, ginormous. It's got a very uh, large Italian uh, ethnic background. Um, pizza is a white tablecloth, fancy food. It is never served uh, at lunch. There was a pizzeria that opened up just before we got one on our trip that was open at lunch. And it both horrified, shocked, and delighted people in Brazil. I, I, I had lunch there with a Brazilian food writer for one of their uh, newspapers. And she said, oh my God, pizza at lunch, it's like a dream. <laughs> <laughs> we're like, where have you been? But it turns out they have their own unique style of pizza. So does Buenos Aires. Argentina got a lot. And the pizza culture in Argentina and the pizza culture in uh, Sao Paulo really didn't mix very much. I mean, it's different languages, different countries, you know, hundreds of miles. Uh, so anyway, we thought that was also quite interesting. Um, and I mean, and look, hey, that kind of like completes the circle. Tomatoes originally, I think so many people think of Italy and tomatoes as like the defining food ingredient and tomatoes originally South American, right? Absolutely. So tomatoes uh, don't come to the new world until um, I think the third Columbus expedition in 1493. They are widely mistrusted. Um, and it's for a reason that is kind of funny because it echoes food phobias today. Uh, people had correctly identified from the shape of the leaves that the tomato is part of a broad family that includes a plant called deadly nightshade. And so they were afraid that tomatoes are poisonous. And that, so, and ironically, the last part of Europe to accept the tomato was Italy, which, <laughs> is truly crazy given how much Italian food in the, certainly in the American view, but even in, in Italy, how much they rely on it today. Um, well, is, so, I mean, it's, 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 it's made it till the 20, uh, to, to 20, 2021, I was like, what year is it? 2021, I mean, Tom Brady famously uh, was on a diet that didn't include tomatoes because his wife was, for some of these reasons, about. Uh, oh, yeah, there are people who are still else, freaked right? out about tomatoes, but yeah. like, there's a lot worse shit for you in the world than tomatoes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, um, so uh, these things all came together to make what we have a concept of pizza as. And, uh, it, you know, if pizza had not left Naples with all of these immigrants, it probably would be uh, a niche food product that you only find in one city, in Naples. Um, and it, Italy has got that, all over Italy, you can go to a village and that village will make something, a pasta, a sauce, a whatever, that no one else makes. <laughs> and, uh, it's just a characteristic of the hyper, hyper local phenomena. Um, and so pizza could have been that. And I say that because pizza tried to expand out of Naples in the um, 20th century we, within Italy, didn't hardly get any traction. Um, even today, there's a version of pizza called pizza frita, which is sort of like a fried, a deep fried calzone. Now, America loves deep fried food. We love it. We love pizza. So surely we have fried pizza here. And the answer is no, we don't. Mm. And there's maybe a couple places in the US that make it, but it's a weird niche little thing. And in the city of Naples, there's a couple places that make it, but by and large throughout Italy, you can't find it. So uh, anyway, pizza 
in, in the United States is what convinced the world that pizza was a great thing. Um, it eventually reinvaded Europe, um, actually largely because of American tourists coming and demanding it. <laughs> mm. um, and then finally in the 1990s, people in uh, Naples uh, saw that American pizza was sort of invading the whole world and finally said, damn it, we have the original one. So then they started this second diaspora of pizza around the world where they said, make it the authentic traditional way. Except the authentic traditional way is neither authentic nor traditional, but it's very good. So I, 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 I like it, but uh, um, anyway, it's a crazy process the way people got pizza. And there are so many strange pizza culture things. It's, um, it's hard to believe. Well, the nice thing about your book and, and listeners, I'm not going to spoil it. You got to go buy the book and read it. Um, so many <laughs> little tidbits about like the margarita pizza naming to the, I tried to describe the infrared heat story and blocking the pizza and it going uncooked. And it, every single person I've tried to describe it to, I've failed. So listeners pick up the book and you can read a much more uh, scientific discussion uh, about it. But it's it's fascinating. Um, all right, so let's say listeners buy the book, they pick it up. I'm a physical person guide. I'm gonna go through, uh, you get to volume three and it's got the sort of iconic pizzas uh, to try out, the, the sort of master recipes. Give me like, if I wanna do my first three uh, pizzas, um, my go-to before this was the Nancy Silverton. Uh, she had a dough recipe that's yeah. uh, phenomenal. But let's say I'm gonna work my way through, I don't know, three, four, five of these. What's sort of the order? What, what, what would you suggest well, the, as the style to try first? Part of it depends on what your oven is. So for a home oven, the pizzas that come out best are the, thick, are the ones with thicker crust or very thin crust. The Neapolitan pizzas, which are baked in a very hot oven, sometimes 800 or 1,000 degrees, you're not going to get that in your home oven. Uh, now, we describe how you can simulate it, and you can make something like it, but a Detroit-style pizza or a uh, focaccia-style pizza is probably the simplest thing to make. It's, it's sort of hard to go wrong. Um, next, I would say, would be a New York-style pizza. Um, and in the book, we try to do two things. We try to say, here's what the iconic ones are. So the, the iconic Neapolitan pizza is um, margarita, it's uh, buffalo milk mozzarella or cow milk mozzarella and tomatoes and oil and that's it. It's very simple. Or, you know, a classic New York pizza is either cheese or cheese and pepperoni. Um, but we also try to give creative uh, pizzas and we have you know, probably more than a thousand recipes in the book that will go into a variety of creative things. It's either a creative different topping or sauce or combination. Um, we also have a, a section on how to adapt your own favorites and make your own pizzas. So suppose that you've got a recipe for a pasta sauce that you love. We tell you how you can adapt it to make a pizza sauce or take a soup recipe that you love. Those can be adapted into pizza recipes. I don't guarantee every soup recipe out there will make a good pizza, but if you've got your favorite, uh, there's no reason not to experiment a bit. So I'm gonna give you a couple quick Twitter questions because I had opened this up. I said, all right, I got a, I got a pizza. Um, chef on the show and by the way my favorite response was this as a as an engineer you're gonna love this um i said hey you gotta ask a, uh, a guy who just wrote a pizza book about um question burning in your mind and one guy um was asking what's the be best way to encourage leoparding from a standard home oven but then someone else respond this is paul b trade says i don't know if i would necessarily recommend it but i have a friend who hacksawed the locking pins off his oven door and cooked all of his pizzas with the oven in self-cleaning mode so he could get it up to almost 700 degrees. <laughs> yep, <laughs> which is there, are, 
<laughs> there are people who do that. The most um, interesting <laughs> at home hack I've ever heard. Uh, yeah, I. If I were doing that, I wouldn't do it in my home. I might do right. that, <laughs> you know, in uh, a fireproof area, uh, because um, uh, it, it certainly could go wrong. Um, so uh, I'll give you a couple quick ones, uh, quick questions. Um, the, the 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 answer to the leoparding question yeah. is, uh, we like cooking pizza on a metal plate, so uh, something we call a pizza steel. So it's a, a plate of metal. Aluminum works, um, steel works. Uh, the thicker, the better. So a quarter inch is okay. A half inch is even better. And you get it really hot. And the reason why you want that rather than stone is that stone takes a while to release its heat. And that doesn't give you that leoparding. The leoparding is about what happens in a very high heat environment where you get these little spots of, of almost black on your pizza while the rest of it is, uh, is not that dark. Uh, so we like using pizza steel for that. Um, if you had to eat a frozen pizza, who's, uh, what's your go-to or who's, uh, what, what's the frozen pizza you would pick? I, I don't eat frozen pizza. <laughs> um, I, I have in my life, but uh, I, I if I'm at the store, I will, I would not buy it. You'll just skip a meal. All right, deal. Um, dough sauce toppings, rank order. What's the most important, the quality of the, uh, the pizza? It, that depends on what style of pizza you're making. Mm. Uh, you know, if you're uh, the Brazilian pizza or some of the other super thin pizzas, the crust is so thin that, um, yeah, well, it's got to be well executed. The toppings are more important. Uh, that's also true in something like the uh, Chicago deep dish pizza. Uh, well, one set of experiments we had, it, we called cross crusting. <laughs> so by tradition, there's a certain recipe you'd use for a Chicago deep dish crust. There's a very different recipe you'd use for a Neapolitan pizza. And different again for a New York pizza. Well, I wondered, okay, what if you actually used New York dough to make your Chicago pizza or Chicago dough to make your Neapolitan pizza? And so we tried all the combinations <laughs> and some of them work super well. In fact, they're arguably as good or better than the, the one that's supposed to be uh, correct. Uh, and others kind of fail. So th that's another way to look at it is if you've got dough, there's a whole bunch of different pizzas you could actually make from it. Um, you know, sauce is important depending on how much sauce there is on a pizza, right? There are some pizzas that are actually very low amounts of sauce and then it's not quite as important. And I, I think you, you, you certainly wanna have a, you better like eating your sauce because it'll be on your pizza and sauce on a pizza plays usually plays the role of being the acidic element that helps balance the fact you've got lots of uh, grease coming out of the cheese, possibly out of sausage or other meat. And so it really has got to be a little sweet, but also it's got to have enough tartness that the whole thing holds together. How many, uh, how many more years until we get a Mirvold 2000 pizza making machine uh, <laughs> that, that can compete with uh, Domino's and just send you uh, pizza on demand? What do you well, think, it's, it's funny, there's several um, startups that uh, went after making uh, robotic pizzas. Uh, there was one called Zoom uh, that was in the Silicon Valley area. There was another that uh, was uh, here in the Seattle area. Uh, Zoom went bust. They, they couldn't make it work, which is unfortunate. Uh, their idea was that you'd have a pizza robot in a truck and the pizza would get made while they're driving it to you. So when it pulls up at your house, it's literally right out of the oven. Um, and that would be pretty special. Um, at the moment, robotics is not cheap enough that you could make a robot pizza that would work reliably that 
you really could afford to have at home. But that will be a great day when that's developed. And it will occur. Right. Reminds me of the old Snow Crash book, Neil Stevenson. Uh, what was it? The Deliverator Pizza. Yeah. Um, we got about 10 minutes. So I'm going to hop on to a couple other topics just because I want to uh, pick your brain on a couple of things. Um, most of the show is focused on investing. And you kind of pioneered an idea um, with your company, Intellectual Ventures, almost 20 years ago now, I think. Is that right? Yeah. Um, talking about invention as sort of a discrete asset class uh, on how to think about encouraging and innovating, um, putting money in the hands of people who come up with new ideas and cross discipline, et cetera, et cetera. Um, as you look back over the past two decades, uh, you know, the, the sort of concept you had, how have things changed? Um, is there areas you think, um, you know, uh, as you reflect on, you know, 20 years of, of creation and invention, um, do you think about it the same way you did 10 years ago, 20 years ago, or are there, as you look well, to the future, are there things you'd be doing? You know, the, the, the basics are the same, of course, you know, we live in a technological society, new invention is critical to us. Uh, we all expect that the next version of the iPhone or the next car that we buy or the next service that we wind up using for whatever is better than the one today. And better usually because someone had some technological idea about it. Uh, so that's not changed. Um, you know, we had hoped to uh, get more capital going directly to the invention layer, you know, to the people who have the great ideas and that's happened to some extent. Um, I wouldn't say that it's happened as much as I would have liked or would have thought it, it could have moved. Um, and that's because people still like to value uh, companies uh, that are off pursuing an idea um, for, for good reason. Um, you know, if you're a, and a lot of this depends on how difficult your idea is. Um, if you've got a very difficult idea to develop, one that's time consuming and expensive, uh, it's still too hard to get capital, I think. I mean, one example of that is nuclear. Um, we have a nuclear spin out company called TerraPower. Uh, it's been quite successful. Uh, TerraPower recently announced we have a deal to build a power plant in uh, uh, Wyoming. I saw that. Congratulations. So it's been a long time it's, coming. That's been a long time coming and it's not easy. Um, uh, the, the, the area where it's easiest is if you have a new idea in, you know, for a simple web service, you know, the WhatsApp was a pretty straightforward thing. It was building a web version of what texting was and WhatsApp or a variety of other uh, things like it around the world. That wasn't a super hard idea to labor for 10 years on. Um, you could just immediately turn it into a company and the people who did and did so quickly did super well. Um, we're working on a bunch of very hard ideas, um, ideas in solid state physics, you know, like, you know, could you make room temperature superconductors? Um, you know, a huge amount of fossil fuels comes from, uh, from fossil fuel usage, I should say, comes from fluid drag, right? Boats have drag, that's why we need to have motors push them through the uh, water. Airplanes have drag. Could we reduce that drag? Well, that's a pretty big problem, and it's a pretty, and we've got exciting results, but in these areas where you have to keep laboring on for many years, uh, it's, uh, well, it's not trivial to arrange the capital and the expertise and the patience because you aren't as easy to implement as WhatsApp was. Yeah. Well, I, I was laughing as you were talking about this because um, one of y'all's defining uh, inventions was uh, the vaccine storage, uh, yes. you know, for Ebola. And, and 
as you talked about WhatsApp and as um, you know thought about this vaccine storage, I said, well, Nathan, here's here's a perfect example is you just needed to mass produce that for beer. And there you have Yeti and you <laughs> made bill billions of dollars. You've got to focus on the, the beer. Well, no, it's, but that's the interesting <laughs> thing is the, the Yeti people went with the idea of creating a brand that was around quality in an area that frankly had been around low price crap. Previously, I'm, I'm the styrofoam is the break. You buy them at 7 Eleven. Exactly. They, a half an hour later, your car is full of water and ice. And yet, for some reason, the world thought that was enough for a long time. So, uh, the Yeti guys uh, and girls <laughs> are to be commended at doing what they did. They didn't need a new technology. Now, in our case, we invented this vaccine container, which was utterly critical in ending the last two um, Ebola epidemics. And that's mostly a thing to be proud of. It wasn't financially a giant success, but hey, at least we got that. Um, so, uh, you know, sometimes what wins in the market is uh, an idea, like in the case of Yeti, that the time was come to not have that cheap $1.59 um, styrofoam thing, but actually have something that was quality, even if it cost more money. And, you know, in principle, you could have done that 10 years earlier. You weren't waiting for some scientific breakthrough. Um, but they did it at the right time, and my hat's off to them. In no, fact, you... the, uh, uh, we're, it, it's occurred to me, and I, I travel a lot and go to a lot of wild places for um, uh, my photography. And uh, it's occurred to me that really the world is ripe to have a lot better food on the go. So that's one of the areas we're quite interested in is, yeah. uh, you know, and how then, can you have a better food experience? So, some countries do a, a great job of it and some don't. I mean, traveling in, in Japan, I mean, you go to 7-Eleven and that's like some of the best food you can find, uh, you know, in other countries. You go to 7-Eleven here, you get rotating hot dogs that have been there for <laughs> yeah, six, yeah, exactly. six days. Been there for the last month. <laughs> um, as we start to wind, wind down, uh, you've been very gracious with your time. Um, like you mentioned, you, you've had a pretty eclectic interest and curiosity over the years. I think you may have more T-Rex uh fines than than anyone in the world <laughs> although i don't see any in the background of your office it looks like, like <laughs> iron Man the t-rex is there. at home <laughs> yeah um what's your main curiosities over the next decade as we look to the horizon we look to the future um we got people blasting off into space uh what's got you most curious and excited today Are you guys going to do a dessert cookbook uh you're going to What's uh? What's oh, oh, we're certainly. I mean, when it comes to cookbooks, we're certainly going to do a dessert cookbook. That is a large, uh, important area that we haven't uh, touched yet. Um, we're, uh, you know, more broadly, uh, I'm interested in how society uses technology. What are the areas going forward that um, uh, where we can take a fundamentally different approach? I mean, what, one example is uh, this COVID uh, pandemic was predictable. I mean, I predicted it, lots of people predicted it. We didn't know exactly when, of course, but it happened a hundred years ago in, in you know, 1918 and some kind of pandemic is gonna happen now. And it's obviously gonna be worse now because the world is such a small place. People fly in airplanes, you, you can't, keep it in an area. But the world's known about coronaviruses and you know, pathogenic ones for a long time. Um, there was a SARS-1 uh, epidemic. There was something called MERS. There's a couple of coronaviruses that, are, uh, that cause common cold symptoms. If we had just made a vaccine for those things as soon as we found them, we would have been vastly better off. Um, and now there are some proposals that people are making to say, hey, why don't we just make a damn vaccine ahead of time for every family of viruses? And it may not be perfect, but at least it gives you 
something to do when there's a disaster again. So we're in a better position and we don't have to kill so many people. You know, this unfortunately, this pandemic will kill millions by the time it's finally done and it's not done yet. Um, and, and yet the idea of prospectively solving a problem we don't have yet, that's really not a medical idea. Um, it, yet we've also discovered in other areas, preventative medicine is just vastly better than trying to, to fix things. You know, you, you'd rather prevent the car accident than say, oh, here's how the ER fixes broken bones better. Um, you still want to fix broken bones better because you know, there's some accidents you can't stop. But uh, I, I think that whole preventative approach to medicine will be very interesting. Uh, I think how we continue to use um, the, com the world of computing going forward uh, is going to be really fascinating. Um, a lot of people have developed these weird ideas about AI, that AI is going to be a bad thing. Um, uh, you know, it, it, I, I wish it worked that well. <laughs> I, I'm very interested in, is interested in seeing how AI make relieves us of tedious, boring work. And for the foreseeable future, the, the work that a computer would take away from a human is work that is probably not that interesting to the human. <laughs> Uh, it, automation really is always about what is the lowest hanging fruit to get great productivity. And great productivity means we don't have to work uh, 80 hour weeks to make ends meet if you're at the lower part of the socioeconomic uh, scale. I mean, my, my mother, I grew up a single family uh, home. My mother was a, a private school teacher and she would work other jobs. and. It was super touch and go for us growing up. So I, that's why I understand people eating food on the basis of being cheap, because I grew up that way. Yeah. Um, now, since then, yeah. I've also learned, hey, as, as uh, affordable pleasures go, better food can be very affordable. Yeah. You know, it doesn't have to be lots of money. $5 for something, a $5 difference can be the difference between something that's trash and something that's wonderful. Agreed. Um, listeners can't see it. So if you're watching this on YouTube, you can. Uh, give us the meaning behind your shirt. The, uh, oh. <laughs> the uh, <laughs> yes. nearly invincible water bear. This is um, a shirt about a animal called a tardigrade, also called a water bear. Um, this is a very tiny animal. They're a millimeter or less. So, you know, um, a, down to a 25th of an inch, a 50th of an inch. So super tiny. Um, basically any clump of moss you've ever encountered in your life has some water bears on it. Um, there's also other things, but that's the simplest is moss. And, they have this amazing characteristic that um, if the moss dries up, they don't die. They, they turn into a sort of a battle hardened version of themselves called the ton phase. And in the ton phase, you can't kill them. Um, heat that would kill any other organism doesn't bother them. Vacuum doesn't bother them. Um, uh, radiation doesn't bother them. Uh, and so that, that here we have a water bear and it, the motto is water bear don't care because <laughs> I was when I'm throw always talking what my, you want. I'm, I'm always talking to my friends. Anytime somebody brings up aliens, I say, man, things are weird enough here. Uh, this is like a perfect example is like, you can't even imagine an animal like that. And here we are, they're everywhere. Uh, like you said, in every piece of moss. Um, and uh, well, hey, look, look them up online, tardigrade or water bear and see some pictures. They're pretty crazy looking things, no eyes, <laughs> um, you know, uh, but they're also 
strangely cute, <laughs> which is yeah. the other yeah. thing that's weird about them. Most microorganisms I wouldn't call cute, but these guys I would. No, I don't know if I saw a life-size one, I would say the same thing. I'd probably think out of a <laughs> horror movie nightmare fuel, but uh, they are uh, cute when they're small. Last question. Uh, Chef Mirbold's got to pick one slice to eat tonight and one slice only. What's his favorite? Oh, well, if I'm only having one slice, I should probably go deep dish. So it's, it's yeah. all of dinner. Um, you know, at most of the deep dish Chicago places, the uh, one slice weighs a pound, <laughs> which is just crazy to me. Um, you know, meanwhile, in Italy, a, uh, a, in a whole pizza uh, that is uh, Neapolitan style uh, will typically be 300 grams. So it's you know, a third of a pound, mm. something like yeah. that. The, uh, some of those Chicago style, they can be like, it's like a, eating like a whole casserole. It's just like a, a yeah, very and dense and delicious. It will eat. So that's one of these things where people, some people say, I don't like that. I like this other thing. It, you have to take it for what it is. And it is a casserole, but it's a casserole of pizza related stuff, sausage, garlic, cheese, uh, sauce. Uh, and so forth, um, which can be pretty delicious if the ingredients are delicious and it's well made. Um, it's making me hungry. Perfect, perfect way to uh, tie a bow in the show. Listeners, check out Modernist Pizza due out this fall. Nathan Mirvold, well, thanks for joining us today. Okay, well, thank you. <laughs>